today we're covering another some other fruits that generally aren't supposed to grow here, but they grow anyway. So uh, the main subject for today is the apples. <clears throat> I mean, we didn't grow apples at all until they promoted. I think the first one they promoted was Beverly Hills Apple back in 1965, perhaps. <clears throat> So apples weren't supposed to grow here. Apples are from somewhere in the middle of southern Russia uh, originally. He said that uh, there are wild apples in those regions. However, the modern apple doesn't seem to be that close related to any of the wild apples. So they're not exactly sure where the original domesticated apple came from. But it's been around mankind. They said man's been growing them for at least uh, 4,500 years. So. Um, but now the apples are pretty much grown throughout the world. In fact, uh, Australia is one of, you know, a fairly large producer of apples, even though the climate there is mostly tropical. So, uh, but back in the 60s, I remember we grew Beverly Hills, which was decent flavored, but not a very good, no good hang time, no good shelf life. Uh, so it wasn't all that popular. And then around 1980 they promoted one that someone had found in Whittier called uh, Gordon Apple. So I grew Gordon Apple, that was one of the first, that was the first apple tree I grew and it was pretty mediocre. It was, you know, it was impressive because the fruit was big, uh, good hang time, good shelf life, but really on the tart side, but that was the first apple promoted in this area and then I, friends of mine down at uh, Pacific Tree Nursery down in Chula Vista said, Anna's a lot better than that. And Anna was, was just at that point recently imported here from Israel. Uh, this is out of the Anna apple. And so we grew that one and that was certainly a good apple. So we started growing more and more apples. Every year we picked up a new one it seems. Someone from the Laguna Niguel brought me a bag full of Brayburns. They said, this thing is incredible in Laguna Niguel. And Brayburn is a New Zealand apple. Uh, we thought, boy, this is really good. And then one by one, we tried the commercial apples and said, they seem to work. I grew Red Delicious in the 1990s and it was fine. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as good as some of the ones in the store, but it was fine. It, it, it tasted fine. So. Uh, so every year now we've picked up more and more apples. Uh, it could have been about half a dozen years ago, Dave Wilson Nursery, which is the largest supplier of fruit trees in California, uh, planted an orchard in, in Irvine just to see what was going on. And they said uh, pretty much everything in their orchard in their catalog does well in Irvine with two exceptions. They said uh, uh, Liberty and Honeycrisp weren't, probably weren't worth growing. Of course, Honeycrisp is, there, is the number one rated eating apple right now, so it's so we still carry it, even though it, it does make fruit. I mean, you know, it, it does make hundreds of apples every year, but it it uh, it doesn't get any size to it here, so that's one of the problems. Now, apples probably are a little happier in the northern climates, or north of here anyway. We're we're what uh, 40. 42 degrees above the equator, so probably a little bit higher more north they do a little better. Um, and they certainly like a lot of water. So that's one limitation we have is they like it pretty wet. So apples probably wouldn't work well in an abandoned field where some other fruits can make it. Apples generally would not. Now among the problems we have with apples, Besides lack of water, there is one bad disease we get here. And that's fire blight. Um, in fact, everything we're talking about here today, these are all related. Apples are in the rose family of plants. Uh, apples, pears, quince, loquats are all in the palm part of that family. They make uh, a similar type of fruit. Um, but they all can suffer from fire blight. So fire blight is a bacterial infection that bees carry. So you need the bees to pollinate the flowers, 
but they can carry fire blight. So fire blight is a uh, bacteria infection of the sap and it has evolved to make the bees its partner in crime. So when you have a fire blight, now I, I don't have a sample fire blight at my nursery here, but what happens is if a stem is infected with fire blight, it kills that stem. But if you don't cut the stem off, in the winter when it's raining or during humid weather, the infection will ooze uh, a substance that looks like honey. So the bees will land on it, try to take a look at that, uh, and then take off because it's not honey. But then they carry that bit of ooze with the uh, spores in it to the next apple, quince, uh, pear, or loquat flower and then it infects that flower and it goes from there. So when you get fire blight, so you take a look, you know, you can do it two ways. You can keep an eye on your apple trees, pear, loquat, quince when they're blooming, and if the flower is drying up normally so it just turns kind of a tan color, you're good. If it goes black on you, if that flower petals turn black, you can say, oh, that's fire blight, and you can just snap that flower bud off of there and stop that before it gets down the stem. Or you can spray it with a product called Garden Foss. Last year this was called Agrifoss, but they put instructions on for homeowners instead of farms, which helps. So now it's Garden Foss. And in you know this in California, this is registered as a fungicide, so it's got the EPA numbers on it, everything. In some states, they just register this as a fertilizer. So what it is, it is mono and dipotassium salts of phosphorus acid, so potassium and phosphorus, but a real high dosage of phosphorus, much higher than the plant normally gets in the ground. And the phosphorus is one of the main ingredients in the plant that helps fight off disease. So it raises the phosphorus level of the plant sap, and uh, it does a good job against fire blight. Uh, we use it for downy disease on roses, impatiens, uh, basil, onions, um, root rot on avocados. I mean, when this first came to the U.S., I don't know where it was developed. Was this, I think this might have been developed by South Africa, but we got letters from the University of California saying that this can cure an avocado tree that's almost dead from root rot. They were very impressed with how well it works. They said the tree can have like 10 leaves left and you inject this into the trunk and it comes back to life. So very, very impressive product that's not a true fungicide. It's more or less um, building up the plant's immune system. Uh, now there are several ways you can apply this. If you've already got leaves on your tree and it's blooming still, there's instructions for foliar spraying at a real low dose. I think it's one to two teaspoons uh, in a gallon of water. If you're spraying, if it's right before it blooms and there's no leaves yet, you can just spray the trunk and lower branches of the tree uh, at a one-to-one -one ratio with water. Just really dose the bottom of the trunk and the lower branches and that'll pretty much get it too. So, But you never know if you're going to get it now. At my own home, I've only seen it one year. 1996 was the year after the bad El Nino and uh, almost every single apple tree I had got it. Certain apples are more susceptible than others. Uh, I would tell you Granny Smith just doesn't. You know, it, it tolerates and resists uh, fire blight very, very well. Because I know that year I got it, my neighbor didn't treat his Granny Smith and it just didn't seem to bother it much. Whereas Gala, boy, it was just about killed my Gala tree. So when fire blight gets to a tree, <clears throat> the infection goes from the blooms and then it travels down the stem like gangrene. You can see it, everything's turning black. Um, it looks like it's been scorched by a fire. And then it just goes down the stem. Sometimes it'll stop at the trunk on a young tree. Sometimes it goes down the trunk and takes out the whole tree. So my gal apple, which was about eight foot by eight foot at that time, uh, it was looking so bad we just cut it off at two feet. Now, uh, apples are real resilient. It grew back its entire top within three or four months, but no crop for that year. Uh, my other apple trees, we just we didn't have to do a whole lot for them. 
but the gallo was, was in danger of dying, so we did that to it, and it grew back. So, so fire blight, keep an eye on it. You may never see it. It depends on the bees in your neighborhood and whatever other trees in your neighborhood have fire blight on them. Uh, the other thing that apples can get, now there's two kinds of apple worms. One is coddling moth, that's the one we get here. There's another worm or maggot that they can get too, but I have not seen that, but definitely we can get the coddling moth. And this affects apples that ripen August through October. So there's some apples we grow that ripen before then, some apples that ripen after that. In fact, I would tell you our major apples we like to sell ripen before or after the coddling moth season. So we don't usually have to worry about them that much. The coddling moth, the moth flies around, lays the egg. Now generally what they do is they have to hide their eggs. If they just laid it on the skin of an apple, some other bug would come around, see that, eat it, no problem, you know, no problem. Where two apples touch each other, they hide them right where they touch each other. And so when you see coddling moth them, you see a, usually see right where the apples touch, you'll see a hole in both apples going both directions and a worm inside of each. So the first line of defense is to thin them out so that they don't touch. And generally apples are thin to one. Uh, when they bloom in the spring, there's usually a cluster of up to nine, ten flowers, and you'll get a cluster of apples forming. Now we thin out most of our clusters a lot. You won't see nine or ten, but uh, this one still has three. Now this generally does not get worms because this ripens in November, December. <coughs> but if this was a Fuji or a John of Gold, and you had three together, that's bad, cut off two of them. And the, the earlier you cut them off, the more energy will be put into the reigning apples, although some apples are so big, you may not want, you may not want that big an apple on the tree. Some apples are so big they can break branches. So thin out the apples, that's the best defense against the calling moth. Uh, we've only seen a few apples that still get the moth, as, even when you do thin it out. So in our, in our, in my backyard, it was um, John of Gold and Mutsu, which is also known as Crispin, that still got worms in the apples even when we thin them. Uh, the other apples in our backyard, you thin them out so there's only one, you don't seem to get any. Now, uh, there's other defenses, and I guess in some areas the calling moth could be real severe and they have to treat them anyway. So they either treat them, now, nowadays they use something like Captain Jack's, which is organic, but 30 years ago, one of the things that the University of California did was they wanted to help the, um, the organic farmers with apples, how to treat the apples for calling moths without using chemicals. We didn't have this back in those days. So they said, do we get a number two paper bag, which is about a paper bag this big, and you take an a, a X-Acto knife or pocket knife and slice a hole in the bottom. And then when the apples are about the size of a golf ball or so, you slide the, the bag over the fruit and you roll up the other end and the apple will develop in the bag without any damage from anything. Apparently the calling moths don't recognize paper bags as fruit and neither does anything else. So they would develop inside there. Now, about 10 years ago, Sunset Magazine, maybe 15 years ago, uh, said Ziploc bags work better. And so they put each apple in a Ziploc bag they cut a hole at one bottom corner of it just to let any excess moisture out. And they said the apples in the Ziploc bags had better color, better flavor than the apples that weren't in the bags, which is quite interesting. So that was their take on it. Now their, their headquarters are in Palo Alto, so they're not extreme. Well, they get pretty warm there. They're almost like this climate, maybe a little cooler, a little bit cooler there. 
So uh, Ziploc bag, you know, I would say on the apples that are hanging more in the shady parts of the plant, that might be safer than an apple on the top of the tree where the bag's going to heat up quite a bit. In Japan, they use uh, the, the um, tradition with silk stocks. Slip a silk sock over each fruit. And that's why apples in Japan cost like four or five dollars a piece. Um, but they would use cloth bags to do the same thing. So anytime you cover the fruit. Now, one of my neighbors, former neighbors, used aluminum foil. Of course, that doesn't stretch very much. She would put, they would put that on when the fruit was nearly ripe. But they did that to stop rats. So, aluminum foil around the apples. Okay. Um, so, you mentioned the uh, Captain Jack. When would you spray? They say but once the fruit's about the size of a golf ball, you'd spray it every couple of weeks until it was ripe. So golf ball. Yeah. I would say when it's about half ripe or half size that I would start, but they start earlier. So perhaps in the real heavily infested areas they'll attack just about anything. Now the codling moth larvae uh, come out the fruit. And usually on an older tree, they will make cocoons in the rough fissures of the bark. So on an older tree, the bark's fissured, they'll make cocoons in there. So one of the things, one of the other methods they use on organic farms, they said is wrap the trunk in cardboard and all the cotton moths go into the cardboard in those little crevices in the cardboard and pupate. So then, then they just unwrap the tree and throw the cardboard away each winter. And that'll stop a lot of them from overwintering that way. So. But again, you know, if you get the early or the late apples, um, you don't even have to worry about that. And if you thin them out good, you're not going to get that much damage unless you go with some of the oddball ones and get them. Okay. Um, Can I overdo the garden pot? I mean, would you say it's fertilizer? Yeah, it's that, it's pretty okay. strong the way it is. Now I've I've you know I've done the one to one on the trunk and and um, inadvertently hit the leaves and boy it just burns them right off the tree. Now if you make it the weaker solution for the foliage, I don't think you run into too much trouble. But we hate to overload the soil with too much phosphorus. So if you put too much phosphorus on the ground, you start killing off a lot of the good biology of the soil. So don't overdo this one either. But they say in avocado orchards, because the root rot problems are the primary concern, they'll actually take this and put it in their irrigation water once a, once a month. Just water the tree's roots with this. Yes? Uh, Gary, I've got a, a pink lady that's um, where I cut the top for, for uh, shape, but that whole one of the main branches has turned black and is dying back, and I think that's a sure sign of... Yeah, that'd be fire blight. So should I cut it? How far do I cut it back? Well, they want you to cut it... When you get rid of fire blight on a branch, you want you to go 18 inches below the last sign of infection, but if there's not that much tree left, you can just, just cut as much as you can. <laughs> yeah, not a lot going to be left. Yeah. And pruners can can get infected with fire blight too. So if you're trimming a tree and you see any sign of fire blight on there, you should clean your pruners off with bleach, 10% bleach every make cut you make, because they can you can tr certainly transfer. Should I try treating it with that? Yep, yeah. Yeah, that helps. Okay, um, some apple trees get mildew on the new growth. Uh, we find Granny Smith to be the worst that we've seen, where the new leaves just roll and get quite powdery. It doesn't usually cause any long-term damage on the Granny Smith. My neighbor never treated his, but if you in the nursery here, we use an oil spray to take care of the mildew. So if you do get mildew, and I, I, I haven't seen on many other apples the mildew, um, other than Granny Smith, but there may be some others that get it. 
point do you not have to worry about limbs or anything getting sunburned? I've only seen sunburn once on an apple tree. I've, I really haven't treated it. I had an espalier one where, where you know, and those, I think it was sunburn. Yeah, certainly an espalier one with those branches being that flat. Yeah. Um, don't know, I don't know if they'd become immune to it at any point, but you know, you can certainly whitewash any branch on any tree without any dam, you know, you're not gonna hurt the tree by doing that. So whitewash, uh, you can take any latex, light colored latex paint and cut in half with water or use it full strength, it's not a big deal. And just paint what's not a leaf that the sun can touch pretty flush and that'll keep it from overheating and burning. Uh, I had one tree sunburn one time on the south side of it, healed over, but uh, it was pretty severe. But I think I was doing something wrong to that tree because I really don't see sunburn much on apples. Did it happen in the winter? No, it was summertime. If you score the uh, the branch, it'll sprout leaves and, and get and give more shade. More shade, yeah. Because you would have had like a stretch with no leaves, right? Right, right. Yeah, just take a little like uh, exacto knife or whatever, make little cuts, okay. and it'll sprout. Leaves. Okay. Now they are subject to aphids. Generally, if there's no ants on the tree, the aphids are killed off by ladybugs, lace wings, or other good guys within time. Um, if you want to keep ants off your tree, it's hard to beat Amdro as far as uh, getting rid of the ants in your garden. Because the ants, most ants that we know of are cause trouble on your cultivated plants. There may be, <clears throat> one of the native harvesters may be good guys, but most ants seem to want to uh, farm aphids and mealybugs and scale and white fly. There's one bug that's <clears throat> that I've never found a cure for on apples, and that's the uh, woolly apple aphid. So there is a bug called the woolly apple aphid that looks like a rigor aphid, it's kind of grayish, but it produces a lot of waxy stuff, filament, fuzzy waxy stuff. And what it does to the apple trees is it'll get on a patch of the trunk and just sit there and suck on it. And as it sucks on it, it causes uh, a gall type formation on the bark. And boy, I've hit, I've hit woolly apples with everything legal and illegal, and I can't kill them. They seem to always survive the spray. No matter what I use on them, they seem to survive it. Uh, water, blasting with water is as good as anything I've found. And like I, I had a patch of woolly apple aphids on one of my apple trees for like three years. Couldn't get rid of them, couldn't get rid of them. They eventually disappeared. But uh, I, there's nothing I, I could do that would take care of it. So, <clears throat> but not much damage. I mean, they make the bark look kind of lovely, but not too much damage. Okay, as far as training apples goes, um, a big turnaround in the last generation. So in the old days, apples like just about all other trees were trained in open wide vase shape. So you would cut the apple tree down low to start off, let it grow real wide and go up. You know, say 15, 20 foot wide. Horizontal branches made fruit, vertical ones were just there for support. Uh, but recently, you go into an apple orchard, everything is like, like this big <laughs> and this tall. Uh, most apple orchards now, the trees are kept head height or slightly above and well most of them are actually on trellises so and they may be five foot wide so they're planted real close together not allowed to get very big uh, and that's state of the art so what they found out with apples and most fruit trees is that the light penetration in a, in a canopy only goes through about 30 inches and if you have a tree that's much wider than five feet the inside doesn't make any quality fruit, or it hardly makes any fruit at all. So they're saying, yeah, the smaller you keep the tree, the more productive your orchard will be per square foot. 
know, each tree will be making fewer fruit, of course, but you can fit a lot more fruit trees in there and get more production per square foot. So orchards are getting, those small apple orchards kind of lead the way. They, they keep their trees quite small now. Um, so, you know, in the old days, when we got our apple trees in, we would cut the trunk short and force them to branch out. And now we're going, oh, no, nope, that's not the way to do it anymore. So now sometimes we just leave the entire trunk intact and uh, uh, grow it straight up. So spindle shape, they call it a spindle shape, is now the modern way to, to trim an apple tree or a spell here on a, on a line, but if you want a freestanding tree, which I think looks better, uh, something like that. Five foot wide, seven foot, eight foot tall. Uh, the bottom branches being longer so they get the sunlight. And you'll see like this tree, it gets, now this is, well, you know, most of the trees we had that had more fruit on them already sold. This is one of my lighter fruiting apple trees that were like that, but uh, we're amazed at how much fruit they're making the very first year. So, now, in the old days when we used to get apple trees in, and this was like 20 years ago, they would just be a fishing pole, no side branches. And most of the varieties would take four years to get their first crop. Nowadays, we usually see fruit the first year. So it's pretty amazing what the growers do. Um, the only apple that really never gets fruit the first year is Fuji. We never see fruit on Fuji's the first year. But they seem to have the fewest branching. Is that because of the rootstock, or why is that the change? They must use some sprays or just trim them a certain way in the field that makes them do that. Um, I can't tell it's been pruned any different. They must have some chemical or they take certain types of budwood. So like on most, on certain apple trees, there's always been, quote, a spur variety. So on, on Granny Smith, you can get a spur Granny Smith. And what that is, see on normal, normally when they reproduce an apple tree, they'll just cut a branch in the winter carve out the buds and insert them into the rootstock and grow the tree from that. On a spur apple, what they do is they take a fruiting spur that's got fruit on it, like uh, this would be next year's fruiting spur here. It's just a, a three inch long branch, real short, and you know this is a fruiting spur. They'll take the budwood off the fruiting spur and use that to make the new tree, and that tree tends to reproduce It'll be real compact and make a lot of flower buds really quickly. And they do that with Granny Smith, they do that with, I think, Red, Del Red Delicious and Golden Delicious. They have spur apple trees that you can buy that were developed, that were uh, propagated from spurs rather than leaf uh, buds or branch buds. But yeah, I don't know what they're doing exactly. Now, this is, happens to be M7 rootstock. Most of our apple trees come on M111. So there's a lot of different rootstocks in apples. Now, most apple orchards use, uh, I think, M9. But we've been warned not to go with M9 in Southern California. We just don't have enough rain. So up in Oregon, Washington, M9. I think there's other ones uh, and that they use too that keep the trees really small but they said the, prob the two problems, they can't stand up on their own. They always have to be on a support, so like an espalier, uh, and they need the ground to be really wet. Just, they said there's no way you can do them in Southern California. They would just always have crispy leaves on the M9, they said. So they said M111 is, now, you know, the standard rootstock, what it's called, the standard rootstock would be the most drought tolerant rootstock we can get for this area, but the disadvantage of that, the trees grow like crazy and they don't produce for four or five years. So the next best one, and the one we use mostly is M111, which doesn't dwarf them a whole lot, maybe 20, 25%, it's more than standard, uh, but they are more, they're reasonably drought tolerant 
and they start production usually within one or two years. And then we might pick up more on the M7s, so those, we like those. And there's a new one that the growers are promoting called Geneva. They said this one they like also. So we'll see, we'll have to start trying some of the other rootstock. Not all the apples are available on M7 or Geneva. Most of them are available on M111. The M series is E-M-M-L-A, and it was uh, uh, developed or uh, selected in England. So we're using English rootstocks. So they, you know, that they should do more for us here in California to start developing local rootstocks. Okay, so on apples, now the nice thing about apples is among all trees known, it's interesting, among all trees known, apples tolerate pruning the best. They said you cut an apple tree, it literally seals the wound right where you cut it, no further damage from the wound, unless you infect it with fire blight. So, so even though they're real, you know, you gotta keep your pruners clean, uh, you can cut an apple tree down to a stump every other year or whatever you want to do to keep it short and it's not going to affect its overall lifespan whereas you do that to a peach tree you kill it you know two years down the road you stump a peach tree it's gone it can't heal that big a wound but apple trees seem to be able to heal or seal their wounds really really well better than any tree known they said so apple orchards there are some apple orchards that are still around 150 years later Whereas the peach orchards, 12, 13 years is about it. So, real long lived fruit tree is the apples. Okay. So, generally, uh, you want good sun exposure for your branches, and they will develop. Now, when the trees are young, the all the flower buds on a young tree or at the tips of each branch. So what fruit trees do, like apples, what they do is they grow all spring, all summer, don't make any flower buds at that time. Um, by the end of summer or, the, or during fall, they stop growing and the flower buds start forming at the tips of the branches. Now, some of the earlier apples, like this is Anna, and, and in fact, we're such a, um, have a long season here, that I would tell you by midsummer, you've already got good flower bud development at the ends of most branches on most apple trees. But it's usually the, the leaves that get the most sunlight will develop the flower buds, so that's the tip of the branch. So if you were to leave this apple tree alone all fall, your flower buds would form here. Now, if you were to cut this tree back in the winter, you just cut off all your best flower buds for your fruit. If you cut this branch to a lower height in September, then this leaf becomes the most energetic leaf and you'll develop flower buds right here. So if you need to control for height on a young apple tree, um, cut them before fall or right when fall starts and then the top apple leaves of your tree will then make flower buds at those branch tips. Now as the apple tree gets older, it does develop a lot of short branches at the base of each branch and those short branches all produce flower buds and fruit too and those become your main uh, fruiting areas on the apple tree and the tips you can forget about once you get the, enough spurs on the interior. You can just prune them as you please, get rid of all the tip branches. The tips though, they, they claim the apples that grow on the tips, if they don't sunburn, they're really good quality apples because they have had the most exposure to sunlight. Whereas the ones closest to your trunk uh, may be so shaded that they may be a little flat tasting. So, but we do see a lot of sun burning on the tip apples. So it's better to have the apples somewhere in between. Unless it's like this Anna. The Anna is ripe before it gets hot. So. The Anna and the Tosa, they grow all year long. And I That's that true. With an Anna, I had the flowers on the top and fruits on the bottom of the tree. Yeah. And then I 
look at it and uh, I, I mean, I can do something, but I don't know what to do right. So <laughs> I don't know if you can do anything wrong on Anna. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's weak, yeah. yeah. But I mean, then uh, you get a lot of fruit, so you cannot do anything wrong. But then you, you train or educate your tree forever having, like, when you have the fruits at the bottom, you know, when you prune. I'm, I'm, I just want to have fruits at the same time on one tree. And that's, that's the second time that happened. I mean, it may be the better. Yeah, also, I mean, but yeah, if you don't have to I, eat all your food I, I at once. I don't like cut something, mm -hmm. like, you know. It's yeah. fine a problem, but it bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, a, and well, there's a several apples that tend to flower and fruit year round. It is, it is kind of weird that way. And, and other apple trees try to try to make fruit at other times too. Yeah, but so when would you graft an anna? Graft it? Yeah, for example, because it's growing all the time. I mean, yeah. I had fruit in November. Yeah. Now, just so you know, you know, they do grow. So there was an article, I think it was the Rare Fruit Growers magazine back in the 80s. So we looked at it and they said, yeah, they grow Rome Beauty apples on mountains in the Philippines. Uh, Rome beauties are supposed to need like 700 hours of chill, but they said in the Philippines they don't get a single hour of chill because the coldest it's ever been is like 58, 57 degrees. So what they do there is uh, when the crop's ready to pick, they'll pick the crop and two weeks later they will strip all the leaves off the tree and without any leaves on the branches, the next set of flower buds opens up and they get their next crop. So they can harvest any time they want and start a new crop any time they want by stripping the leaves. Well, they can start a new crop, not harvest any time, but they can start a new crop any time they want by stripping all the leaves off. Of course, they have to have the last crop finished and then your flower buds are set again. And then once the leaves are off the tree, then those flower buds wake up and get going. So here they're in a country with no chill at all growing Rome Beauty apples from New York that are supposed to need 700 to 1,000 hours of chill. So uh, apparently apples don't have to have chill uh, to make a crop. However, we did do notice that when we do have a, a better winter, the stems on the apples are longer. And when we don't have much of a winter, the stems are shorter, especially on Fuji. The, Fuji apples are just embedded in the stem because their stems aren't long enough and it messes them up. So, um, so we're not sure on the chill yet if that's, well, I mean, they, they always look better when we have a chill. So these apples that are in the store today, they came from Fresno this last winter. So they had much more chill than the apples that overwintered here. So the apples that overwintered here, the, the main crop, not the annas, but the main ones are just now blooming. Just now blooming. Uh, so when you have a Granny Smith or a Pink Lady apple, they normally bloom May or June. This year they're blooming June because winter was really late. Winter was March this year instead of January. So uh, they decided to wake up a month, uh, I don't know, I was just talking to Tom Spellman yesterday from Dave Wilson who says yeah, everything's six, six to eight weeks behind schedule. So they don't know when the ripening periods are going to be this summer uh, because everything's so far behind because of the unusual uh, frost. They had a frost in March apparently up in the Central Valley. So, so anyway, uh, you can get apples on Anna and Dorset and Einschmere almost any time. Uh, the other apples tend to make crops at close to normal time, although a lot of times if we have a drought shock or if you don't water your apple trees enough and you lose some tip leaves on them, a lot of times in the middle of summer those, they will try to refoliate but the flowers come out first and you'll have a second crop forming that will get about that big in the fall before winter gets too cool but the apples ripen at that size and you'll get a little, you know, crop of little tiny apples on the regular apple trees at that time, the, um, the early apples, you can get two crops a year pretty easily, or we've had a lot of customers tell us, you can pick an apple any month of the year on those apple trees. So, so there's, more, there's more than one, um, I don't know, there seems to be several mechanisms that determine when apples bloom apparently. So they, some apples do have a chill factor, 
but will bloom anyway. And some apples seem to bloom with just if there's no leaves on them. So let's go over some of the apples then. So um, the early apples that bloom really early, Einschmier, uh, Dorset Golden, and Anna. I don't know if there's another one, although uh, Dave Wilson is saying that ghosts may act like Anna. So this ghost might be another one that comes out really early, but we'll have to see next year how it operates. Because you see these apples are almost ripe too, the ghost apple, which is a white apple. That's, that's our new apple for the year's ghost. So anyway, these top three always seem to bloom either late January or mid-February. By mid-February, they're in bloom. And it seems just, if they don't have any leaves on, you know, the winter thins them out at least. And if it knocks off, we have cold, at any cold at all, it knocks the apple leaves off, and these come out real early, even earlier. And they'll bloom. Now, all the apples we grow that I know of are partially self-fertile. They'll make a crop by themselves. They make a little better crop with better shaped fruit if they have a pollinator. So like 40 years ago, I grew Anna and Dorset, which were the two that they recommended. Uh, Einschmier is from Israel, Anna is from Israel. Dorset Golden was found in growing in the Bahamas. Ghost is the California uh, origin, um, I believe. But I grew Anna and Dorset, and I didn't like the Dorsets. Now, around here, I was living in Lake Forest at the time, and the Dorsets ripened in June. And because of our cool, cloudy weather in June, they usually came out too tart. So I decided it wasn't a good tree. Now, my father-in-law at the time grew them in Hemet, and they were fine. Hemet's already 90 degrees in June, so you don't have to worry about the lack of heat or lack of sunlight. So he grew his dorsets. I didn't like mine, pulled it out. When I pulled out my dorset, my Anna made a few fewer apples, still made a lot, more than I can eat. But I noticed that they were not totally symmetrical. They were sometimes, like one side was, instead of being shaped, like the Anna apple shape is a tall apple like this, they're coming out somewhat lopsided. And when you open them up, they're missing, sometimes they only have one seed. Instead of having the comp, I can't remember how many seeds are in an apple, five or six seeds in an apple, they only had one. So I knew that they weren't being pollinated properly, but I didn't like the dorsal enough to replant it, although I could have just grafted a branch onto it. The apples are really easy to graft. So the Anna apple, um, Anna, the, all the early apples have one fault, and that, well, a couple faults. They don't have any hang time, and they don't have much shelf life. So, like the Anna apple, we like to pick this when it's almost totally red. If you wait till it's totally red, it's already mushy. Um, and if you leave it on the shelf more than two days, it's mushy on the shelf. So, but you can keep them quite a while if you put them in a Ziploc bag, squeeze out the air, throw them in the refrigerator, they're good for two months. But out in the open, now oxygen is what makes the apples ripen and continue to ripen. So if you exclude the oxygen, now commercially they just put them in a warehouse filled with carbon dioxide and you put carbon dioxide in there, that's the opposite side of the reaction, so it keeps them from ripening that way too. And they can store apples, you know, Fuji apples are sometimes stored for 15 months before they sell them. <laughs> Grannies, they say a year, but Fuji's can be stored 15 months. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I've done it for two months. Now, one of our employees' mother said, it works better if you stick a soda straw into the Ziploc bag and suck all the air out that way. Then they keep even better. So, so I'm, I'm kind of learning from my mistakes. I'm in the second season. And I have exactly that problem. You have to get a lot of apple at the time. You have to monitor the tree every day to pick the right fruit. 
and then you have it, you can keep it two days, or it costs you extra money with Ziploc and all that other stuff. Right. <laughs> can I do, I mean, I simply don't know what to do with it. For my wife, oh, it's not sweet enough. I mean, I don't care, I eat everything, but uh, you only can eat so much. Can, can, can you make juice out of that? Or is it a, it's not a real juice, it's a table ap apple, not a... Apple. Right, it's, it's more for a table, Anna. Um, I would, here, not, I would not buy that many apple and dosa anymore. Simply. Yeah, and here they say good for pies, drying, sauce, and jellies, but I don't know that's used that much. The flavor on it's not real strong, so it's more of a fresh table apple. So that that's one case for keeping the tree small. Like I kept my Anna tree about this wide and this tall, so I only get about 50 to 70 per year instead of. Like when I had an Anna apple tree that was eight foot wide, that's like 300 at one time. So now, if you know, just keep it like this, and then you have a, a, a amount that you can use and not go overboard with. So, so Einschmier is the first one to ripen. I believe it's June. This is June. This is July. Uh, it actually is end of June into well into July and then Ghost is July. So those are your real early apples. I don't know if Ghost is going to have a problem with storage and uh, hang time. I don't know. It's first year. So we'll see on these apples how they turn out. And then the next apple that we usually carry is Gala, which is August. Now Gala, again Gala, uh, the main problem with it is fire blight. You just have to watch that thing for fire blight. Um, you know what's interesting about the top three is that they're extremely heavy producers. We've noticed that on, you know normally like on a Fuji, the tip of each branch is the only place you're ever going to flower bud. On a Anna, it's like every bud on this branch wants to make flowers and fruit. Every single bud on the tree wants to make flowers and fruit. So you really have to thin them out good. Uh, and the same goes with Einschmier and Dorset. They really can produce a lot of fruit. So much so that you have to thin out, cut off entire clusters. Because you don't want that many apples. Now what's interesting is the Anna apple, which is the, the number one grown apple in the U.S., uh, they've had a quality problem because the growers would be greedy and they would let every apple grow on the tree and they would come out real small and bland. Like if you buy bags in the store, uh, bags of apples in the store, you'll notice that those apples, the small apples, are really bland. Uh, it's because the grower grew too many on the tree. And the more apples you grow, the less sugar and, and acid they have in them. So on, on Fuji, it got so bad that the, the Fuji growers decided to get together and see what was the ideal amount of apples on a Fuji because they didn't want to send really bad out, you know, they didn't want to get a bad reputation and make the Fuji apple not everyone's favorite anymore. So they actually counted the leaves on the tree versus how many apples on the tree to see what the, mac, the ideal amount was and they said 27 apples per tree, per fruit. So at one, Fuji apple for every 27 leaves, you got a real good quality Fuji apple. If you had fewer leaves than that, you got more fruit than that, then they come out pretty flat tasting. So. I haven't seen a study for any other apple tree, but the Fuji has been done. So we Gala in August, and Gala acts more like the later apples. It's got better hang time, better shelf life. Um, the um, John Gold would be next, and this is late August into September. Now John Gold, okay, the other thing about apples is the quality of the fruit is best if there's not a consistent 90 degree temperature the two weeks to three weeks before they ripen. So if you're inland and you're growing Johnny Gold, say in Riverside, and it's 90 degrees for that whole month, or 100 degrees, the apples come out with problems. 
Uh, so what we get in apples, if you've ever eaten an apple and there's a brown portion of the flesh, that's called bitter pit. Sometimes you can see a brown portion from the outside that extends inside. Sometimes you're just eating an apple and there's a brown section inside. Now bitter pit is a lack of calcium in the fruit and it's related, it's the same thing that happens in tomatoes. Tomatoes, the whole bottom turns brown and hard and that's quote bitter pit in a, in a tomato that's also known as blossom end rot. A tomato and apples, it happens uh, on the larger apples especially. So Gala, we normally don't see any bitter pit. Johnny Gold's a big apple, that often gets bitter pit really badly, especially if you're inland areas where it's hotter. So, some of the uh, apples ripen during the hottest time of year. We carry them still because they do really well on Huntington Beach and Costa Mesa and Newport Beach. I mean, I've got a customer who lives in Huntington Beach says, He's got like three or four of these. He said, this is the best apple he's ever grown, but he lives like two or three blocks from the ocean. So he does really well <laughs> John and Gold there. Uh, Gala seems to be able to handle heat okay, but John and Gold especially likes the, likes the coast better. And then we have um, Fuji, and that's September, October. So Fuji, uh, a friend of mine who lives in Laguna Niguel says, oh boy, the Fujis in Laguna Niguel turn out better than the ones in the store. So he really liked his Fuji in Laguna Niguel, but he was probably two miles from the ocean there. So that was, Fuji likes it cooler at, when they're ripening also. So Fuji, now we have red Fuji also. All the literature we have says the original Fuji was better tasting. Now, it's interesting, we saw a report from the Washington apple growers back in the, I think it was the 80s or 90s, they wanted, you know, red delicious apples at the store are kind of bland. So they wanted to tell the customer how to choose which red delicious apple will taste the best. And it turns out, the greenest one. So whatever red delicious apple looks the greenest will have better flavor than the one that looks the reddest. So um, they said, oh, we're not going to tell customers that because we want to grow a really nice red, red delicious apple. So they kind of quit that one. But on Fuji, they said the same thing. The greener the Fuji apple is when it's ripe, the better the flavor. The red Fujis are not as flavorful, but when they, all, when they have taste tests and you can see your fruit, the red Fuji always wins because everybody likes that red color better. So visually, it's better tasting than the green food, the regular Fuji. But anyway, so that's the Fuji apple. And then Brayburn is October into November. Now we carry Honeycrisp, and Honeycrisp is right about here. Don't grow it. it um, now one year we grew it, the coolest spring we ever had with, that we can remember was 2008. It's like the crepe myrtle trees wouldn't wake up until June that year. It was just so cool. And our honeycrisp actually woke up in June that year instead of July like they normally do. So normally the honeycrisp just wait and they wait and they wait and finally in July they wake up and bloom and the fruit ripens in August. It's like okay, they had one month to grow and they come out this big normally. They taste fine, they just don't have any size at all. So in 2008, they actually woke up in June and we actually got apples that were that big. So, you know, a little bigger than apricots. And that was the only year we ever saw Honeycrisp get any size at all. So Honeycrisps aren't that good for the air, even though they still taste fine. But they, you know, and the other thing about growing them, and you know, they were developed in Minnesota. Well, Minnesota, in, you know, when they're growing, they have those 20 hour days up there. And that really helps too. Like they say, you know, the apples from Australia grow much, develop much quicker in Washington, Oregon than they do in Australia because Australia is closer to the equator. Uh, and the more north or south you go from the equator, the longer the summer days are. They just develop faster. So we have Brayburn, October, November. 
And then the Australian outfits come in. You got uh, Pink Lady, Sundowner, and Granny Smith. And these are all November, December. So all the late apples, you know, from here on, all of the later apples have great hang time. They're gonna hang on the tree for a month. They don't go bad. Uh, I mean, we've hung Granny Smith on the tree till February. Uh, you know, two, three months past its ripening date. And now the th interesting thing about Granny Smith is that by New Year's Day they turn yellow and they become really fragrant and they become really sweet. By, by Christmas they're really sweet. So a totally different apple. They don't lose their crispiness. They get a little more tender though, not quite as hard as they were say in October or November when they pick them uh, in Oregon. Um, but you know, I, my neighbor's trees, you know, from my front driveway, his, the apple trees are halfway down our lots. I can get on my car and smell that apple ripening on the tree. It's so, the fragrance is so potent on Granny Smith. I mean, on Granny Smith, we looked up, I had to look up to see where it was developed because at that, you know, Sydney, Australia, that's like Mazatlan, Mexico, same latitude. How could it grow there? I thought maybe there's mountains around Sydney that it's coming from. Well, we looked at the picture on the street where it was from. It's right near the Delta region. You know, that's sea level. And they show pineapples around it. <laughs> it's like, you know, it doesn't need any cold at all. Even though they listed at 500 hours of chill, the origin for Granny Smith is the tropics. So, Sundown and Pink Lady are from Perth, Australia, which is the same latitude as LA. So, those seem to do really well here, too. They wake up late, they ripen late, they get good size, so no problem with those. We think these are our best apples, generally, uh, the Australian apples. Because they have, you know, they have good hang time, good flavor, uh, good shelf life, no worms, uh, not much goes on bad with them at all. They can still get fire blight. Granny Smith maybe not, Granny Smith just gets mildew. Now, Pink Lady and Sundowner are siblings. Um, Sundowner is Australia's number one dessert apple, and I would say, tell you, that's the best apple I've ever grown, taste-wise, uh, Sundowner. Now, in Australia, Mr. Cripps developed these, so in Australia, Pink Lady is Cripps Pink, and you'll see apples at the store called Cripps Pink that are Pink Ladies, and Sundowner is Cripps Red. I don't know why they have to change the names when they bring them here. Um, But anyway, those, we think those are the best. I can't remember if I forgot any apples, let's see. We, this year, early this year, we had some wine saps for people who wanted to try that. Some Arkansas black, they're sold out. And some pink pearl, which have a bright, rosy red flesh. So we'll try to order more of those next year since they sell out so fast. Um, we don't carry Beverly Hills anymore, even though people still are recommended that one. Gravensteins, I've grown them, they do well, but because they ripen in August, they taste cooked. It's just too hot here for Gravensteins. I kind of have grown, it wasn't that good. Uh, Molly's Delicious is not bad. Molly's Delicious is a green red delicious apple that you can grow here and that turned out pretty good. Ripens in August. A pippin apple now. We might bring in some pippins next year. So Newton pippin. It's considered by the apple growers to be the top flavored apple. Uh, I grew in my yard, I don't know, it's kind of a small, flat apple, but up in Oregon they really like Newton Pippin. I 
haven't tried Jonathan yet. And I haven't really grown Golden Delicious. Golden Delicious does well in there, but I really haven't tried that one yet. You did uh, Mutsu? Yes. Mutsu, uh, Mutsu ripens right about here. Mutsu, the apples are like the size of grapefruit. Now Mutsu, back in the 80s, John and Gold won a taste test. In the 90s, it was Mutsu won the same taste test but they were making applesauce out of them. They weren't eating them fresh. But I, I grew Mutsu because they said it was the best tasting apple. Well, the apples just don't ripen well on the tree. And you have to store them for, now, now uh, kind of a long story. Apples used to be the number one crop in the United States easily, easily because back in the 1800s, we didn't have refrigerators. And the apples was one of the few produce items that you can keep all the way through winter. So back in those days, they grew storage apples, not things like this that only that don't have much shelf life, but things kind of like moots where you had a storm for a month before that you can eat them. <laughs> they would just throw them in the cellar and then keep them all winter long. And that was the only fresh produce they had for the entire winter was these apples. And of course, they said too, the, the thing about the United States was, there was no good water quality. So the most, the safest drink you can drink was apple cider. Water, it was always, you're always taking a chance if you drank water. So, so they said apples, almost everything, everyone grew an apple, or had an apple orchard in their backyard. So apples were, you know, by far the most common fruit trees saw in the United States before 1900. Um, but anyway, so Mutsu is like a storage apple. That's, you, you pick it, you go, okay, it's not it's too hard this week, it's too hard next week. <laughs> it's just too hard. And by the time it's ripe, it's dried up because we're not humid here like they are in the Midwest or back East. So it's kind of difficult. I mean, you get, you know, my tree would just get hundreds of these apples that were that big. Most of them had worms, you know, got worms, uh, but, and it's a monster tree. I mean, they, they just wanted to overtake it, my whole yard. So it is, uh, it's a good apple for the area if you, if you like the apple. I, I grafted it onto a uh, Granny Smith, so we'll see how it goes. Is that yeah. like King Tompkins, does that ring a bell? Yeah, I don't, I've never grown that one. It's a high chill requirement, but it's setting. Mm -hmm. That one ripens in September, so heat may be an issue with that one. Um, winter banana we used to grow, and we'll probably carry that one again. That's a light colored apple that ripens in September. Actually, when we grew it, it ripened a lot later than that. Hudson's Golden Gem is one from Canada that we've grown. It's got a brown skin, and that, that seems to do fine here too. Uh, Spitzenberg was uh, Thomas Jefferson's favorite apple. That's from New York. And that one's done well in the area also. I've got, I used to have one in my backyard. Pettingill, a favorite down in uh, Julian. I didn't like it too much. Uh, that's just about all of them. Okay, so that's apples. So most of the training they do on apple trees is have a center stalk that's fairly straight and your side branches should be around 45 degrees or lower so that they make their side branching and make all these little spurs. The branches live a long time, you know, like on peach trees, we cut off the branches every time they fruit. But on apples, you keep the same branch for a decade or more. So apples, fairly easy to uh, train. Just try to keep the branches separated and more horizontal. I mean, there's no rules here. If you wanted two vertical branches, two vertical trunks, you can have two vertical trunks. You want three, you can have three. But the horizontal branches make most of the fruit. 
Okay, on pears, there's like four kinds of pears that you can grow, although only, only one really does well here. Uh, there's the European pears. And then there's the Asian pear, well, I'm gonna have to say Japanese pears. And then there's the Chinese pears. Um, <laughs> the Chinese pears naturally seem to need the lowest chill around 300 hours, but they haven't been all that, I don't know, no one seems to be real interested in them. The Ollie and Suli were shaped like, uh, I grew them for a while, they're shaped like this. <clears throat> uh, most people like either European or Japanese pears. Europeans have that softer, uh, buttery flesh. The Asians have a crispy, light textured, juicy flesh. Uh, but neither one of those seems to do very well here either. But what happened was they crossed the two. When they crossed European and Japanese, the European, Japanese pears seem to need 300 plus hours of chill, maybe even 400 plus. And European, same thing, 300 plus hours of chill, and we're not getting it consistently anymore. But when they crossed them, they got something called an Orient pear that needed less than 300 hours. But it was a lousy pear, it wasn't very good. We grew them for a while, and then some more of those crosses, kefir pear. I'm not sure if that's a bad word or not. Well, kefir is a bad word, yeah. Kefir, I guess, is okay. And this was around 250, <clears throat> maybe might have been 300. Uh, when we grew kefir pear, boy, the whole tree was full of these absolutely beautiful pears. Absolutely no flavor at all. No taste at all, I couldn't believe it. Gorgeous pears. The literature says great for canning. Because <laughs> they're gorgeous, they got no flavor. But beautiful pears, I mean, we couldn't believe it. No flavor at all. So what they did is they took the half and half pears and recrossed them with European. And they got Hood, they got the Florida Home, which got shortened to Flora Home. Flora, uh, they, they did something to the name. Uh, and uh, I think there's a few more, but these two, well, Florida Home needs 300 hours. We're not getting in it. Hood only needs about 100 hours. Um, I used to have both. When the Florida Home died from lack of chill, the hood sulked for a few years, didn't make much fruit, but now my Florida, my hood will make 500 pieces of fruit every year without a pollinator. And they're not bad. Hood's uh, almost as good as a Danju or even a Bartlett pear. So this is a hood pear right, right here. Well, we had some problems with our trees this year. Not major problem, but slight problem. Uh, one of our spray materials that we've apparently been using since last summer is contaminated with something. And what it's doing is it's acting like a growth hormone. It's making the leaves do funny swirls. So we have a lot of pear trees out there where the leaf petiole is curled under and the leaves are rolled. And we trace it down to uh, our spreader sticker, which is the last thing we thought would be contaminated. So it took us a while to figure it out. Uh, we thought it was the agrifos doing the weird growth, and we thought it was something else. But when every, every spray we're using was doing it, we said, okay, it's got to be the spreader sticker that was contaminated with some kind of growth hormone. So we changed, we got a, a more professional spreader sticker and threw away the one we were using. Hopefully it was just one batch of that. But uh, anyway, so the trees are slowly recovering from the curled growth. This branch is coming out fine. This one's coming out fine. Now this one's perking back up. But anyway, uh, hood pear is, uh, needs very little winter. Uh, it takes a few years to start making good pears. Um, but they're not bad. They're not bad. I mean, we were going to cut ours down when it was about 10 years old, but after it was in the last four or five years, the pears have gotten really good on it. 
and it's really done a great job making them. Uh, it's just a little bit um, uh, of a bigger squirrel. I haven't been able to keep this thing small. So in my yard, it tends to grow about 10 feet a year straight up. So keep cutting down the fall to get the blossoms lower. But every summer it grows back up to 20 foot, it seems. And it is subject to fire blight. They said it's less fire blight prone than other pears, but I guess pears must be really bad because it always seems to get a little fire blight over here. It doesn't, it doesn't kill it or anything. It, it's got a lot of you know bad areas on it, but the rest of it, the tree produces really well. So that's your pears. We carry Asian pears because you can grow Asian pears in some of the canyon areas around here. And even we've even had a few European pears. We had the Southern Bartlett. We have Southern King that we offered earlier this year. Because a friend of mine who lives right on the Santa Ana Riverbed, uh, he grows Bartlets there. So we know he's getting around 400 hours of chill along that Santa Ana Riverbed. So then he grows all this stuff that I can't. I've never even tried to grow walnuts, all the different kinds of walnuts and things. So that Santa Ana Riverbed is one of the cooler spots, winter spots at least in Orange County. And I would probably say the same thing for Aliso Canyon or San Juan Creek. Uh, we know LA Riverbed is really cold. A friend of mine has a nursery there and they said they get frost really bad along the Santa Ana Riverbed. So those riverbeds, uh, you can grow the Asian pears, you can probably grow a lot of the European pears. Um, I mean, my dad grew Bartlett pears for 10 years, always got fruit, always this big. And that's what happens when you don't have the chill, they just wake up really late and, and get no size to them. Hosui is the top rated Asian pear for eating. It's listed at 300 hours. Um, we also have 20th century in the store, which is about the same chill on it. So those are kind of the lowest chill Asian pears. Now, Back in the late 80s, I grew 12 kinds of Asian pears. The late 80s, we actually had 500 chill hours every winter. Where we, you know, I remember, I still remember, I was a kid then, had my thermometer outside at night, working in the garden. It's like 35, 36 degrees every night in December and January. And then February would be 80 degrees and all the fruit trees would just explode in the white flowers. And I thought, well, we can grow everything here. Gold nectar plums, elephant heart plums, any apricot we wanted to. Uh, then the 90s happened and we went back to normal. <laughs> and the Asian pears didn't produce ever since. But for four years, well, I was in, I loved the Asian pears. They were great. Now they tend to have the same worm problems as apples, so be careful with those. Uh, same cures, same problems, anything that ripens. Uh, between August and um, uh, October, it gets worms in it. The hood pear ripens in July, I think. Yeah, late July or into August. So if you if you have two pairs touching, they get worms. If you just have one pair. And it's not touching anything. Sometimes it just touches a leaf or a branch that gets worms in that area. So make sure they're not touching anything and then they're clean. And most pears, except for the Japanese, you can't let them ripen on the tree. So you have to pick them when they're just starting to turn less green and ripe them in your house. If you ripe them on the tree, they get suffer from brown core. Brown core is when the inside's riper. So sometimes at the market, you buy a pear, the outside of it's great, you get to the center, it's all brown and mushy. That's brown core. That means they kept it on the tree too long or ripened at too high a temperature. So you make sure you pick uh, the European pears and the hybrid pears. The hood pear is considered a southern cross. It's a back cross, again, between the hybrids and the Europeans, three quarters European. But you pick those, uh, before they're ripe. The Japanese and Chinese pears, you can let them ripe on the tree. So. Any questions on the pears? Okay, okay.
squints. I haven't tried all the quinces yet. Um, this is, I think, the first year for pineapple quince, but so far we've carried Smyrna quince and Cook's quince, and no problem producing. They seem to produce on new growth, so on new growth, apparently you don't need any chill for that. So they just, you just cut them in the winter and then they grow in the spring and make flowers and fruit. So quince look kind of like pears, but they're hairy or fuzzy. And the flesh is extremely firm. Usually you don't eat them fresh. Um, you either bake them or steam them or boil them. Uh, they, the flesh turns redder when it's cooked. And they're, what people like about quince is they're a lot more flavor than pears or apples. So highly perfumed flesh. Um, a lot of people buy them that are from the Eastern European countries. They remember the uh, quince pie and the quince jams and jellies that their aunt made or something like that. They tell me it's just incredible. My daughter baked quince uh, last, last fall and boy, that was good. Baked quince is really good. But yeah, you don't eat them fresh. Quince trees tend to be smallish, not too big and productive and highly susceptible to fire blights. You have to keep your eyes on the flowers. This is pineapple quince, which they said is the most popular quince because it's got a stronger flavor than the rest. It's a smaller fruit, but it's uh, uh, still, they said it's the most popular variety, so we're carrying that one this right now. Quince, well, all these trees are fairly ornamental. Quince is probably the most ornamental, and it's naturally, again, a naturally a small tree. And we brought out, we brought, mentioning the loquat, because loquats are in the same family, and they have fire blight problems too. Now, that spray we're using did this to the uh, one set of leaves on our loquat, now it's recovering. Almost like 2,4-D damage, really. But, that, but I don't know how you prove that someone sold a defective product. But anyway, quince tree, uh, loquat trees, uh, we grow primarily seed grown ones. Uh, one company in California grafts them, that's Laverne, and they, they tend to produce a bit younger. Um, but I don't know how to graft them loquats or we haven't grafted loquats yet so we're selling the seed ones and most loquats sold are seed grown and the quality interestingly on seed grown ones has been pretty good um, I grew 10 seedlings in my yard back in the 80s from the fruit of a champagne loquat and my neighbor and I had this made this hedge out of them and we were certain that nine of the ten were better than the original champagne tree so you go, okay, they, they turn out, so the seedlings do turn out quite good. We thought they were better than the parent was, taste-wise. Now, loquats, the quality of the fruit seems to have changed a lot. Now, <clears throat> when you grow from seed like this, they tend to have to grow about seven foot high and about four foot wide before they start flowering. So when I had uh, the, my hedge of loquats, we had 10 of them. You know, the fifth year from seed was the year they started making fruit flowers and fruit. And loquats have been touted as one of the few fruit trees in California and most of California that can produce fruit without irrigation. They're drought tolerant, they bloom in the fall or, or early winter and the fruit ripens before summer. So if we have normal rainfall, which we haven't had for, well we had some last year but not this year, uh, then they can go through their crop cycle without any water. So you do see loquats in abandoned yards uh, hanging in there doing okay. So the, now interesting on loquats, because of the change in the weather, we seem to be having warmer winters, the flavor is getting mellower and mellower. So back in the 80s when I grew Big Jim, so loquats, there's um, either yellow flesh or white flesh. 
It's like on peaches, yellow or white. Um, the yellow ones, some of the names you'll see, and we, we give you the names that these are seeds from, so they'll be similar. Big Jim is yellow, Macbeth is yellow, Gold Nugget is yellow. I don't like Gold Nugget that much. Uh, white ones are Champagne, uh, Vista, 1Z, 2Z. 1Z, 2Z, now most low quads, oops, get a picture for you. Now where low quad is, you'll see. <clears throat> There's a few hanging on the trees left in Orange County, but most of them have already fallen off the trees, but your low quad is, uh, is that fruit there. Usually about the size of an apricot or smaller. Big gems, which are the biggest, uh, can be almost as big as a tennis ball. About this size. <clears throat> Usually loquats have about five seeds in the middle, maybe six. Eat them like a pear. The onesie twosie has one or two. So that's why they call onesie twosie that. So back 20 years ago, I would tell you Big Jim and is too tart. Didn't like it at all. And onesie twosie was too tart. Didn't like that one either. And now it's like Big Jim is too bland. <laughs> it's gone the totally opposite way. Now it's got no flavor, it's too bland. And Beth has always been mild, and now it's even more mild. Now it's like Vista, onesie twosie, champagne are perfect now. They're more sweeter than they used to be. So. I don't have any Vistas of Whites right now. We have onesie twosie seedlings and Big Jim and Macbeth seedlings at the moment. And you can keep them down to about six feet, seven foot. You have to let them flower before you start cutting them though. Any questions? Okay, we're done. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thanks.